Well, to introduce our first speaker, I actually want to bring up David Schumann, who's also, you've met several times, he's an attorney at NASA Goddard and good friends with our first speaker. So um, David Schumann's going to introduce our first speaker. David? Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor and privilege for me to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Jim Garvin from Goddard Space Flight Center, who I met uh, probably close to 10 years ago. Uh, Jim has a long list of uh, achievements. He's a world-class uh, geologist, worked on a number of instruments for spacecraft that are highly successful, a long list of accomplishments and recognitions from the agency, former chief scientist of the agency, now chief scientist at Goddard. But I want to highlight one aspect that probably doesn't appear in his official bio, which I would consider to be most uh, valuable and absolutely critical for what we're all engaged in, and that's Jim's ability to convey with enthusiasm the great message that we have to carry. It's an underappreciated, under-recognized talent that probably several individuals, maybe a half dozen, have uh, within the agency. It's absolutely critical to convey the message in an interesting way to the public and capture the public's imagination. So Jim is our uh, greatest exponent of that, and uh, you'll see why in his presentation. Jim. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dave and Chris. Um, real pleasure to be here and uh, talking Mars, where, uh, where my little children think I'm actually from. So um, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I don't think it affects the politics of this. But what I thought I'd do today in the next 35 minutes is try to expose for you where we've come in the last decade. Because 10 years ago, I chaired a committee for the then administrator, Mr. Golden, uh, which had the original name. It sounded like, by the way, uh, uh, a booster shot that we all get um, as children, known as the Decade Planning Team, or DPT. And the idea was, yeah, I, I had my DPT booster, um, but uh, the idea was to really craft an integrated strategy, a vision strategy, internal to NASA um, by a skunk works, sounds like the Defense Department, but for integrating exploration of the universe from science and humans together. Because as we look at Mars, um, it really is a very human place. It is a tangible place, and a lot of us appreciate that, particularly in this meeting. So I'd like to share with you the, the enthusiasm and the highlights of the last 10 years. Now, you're going to hear some of our best scientists tomorrow with Paul Mahaffey and, and Mike Muma and some of our best astronomers today, and, of course, Steve Squires last night. So I can't possibly do justice. But let me just say, in the words of a great hockey coach that inspired a lot of us, uh, now almost 30 years ago. This is Mars time, and we're ready to make the next leap. And I think now is the time to convey that message. So let me quickly cut um, from the PowerPoint to the movies, um, and I don't need to say, um, and uh, try to share with that. So where have we come in the last decade? That's really a question that a lot of people ask me. Um, as Dave said, I, I was the uh, chief scientist for the new Mars program um, as uh, as crafted about 10 years ago. And so I'd like to share with you a little bit of the vision of where we've come. So right now we're talking about a new era, um, the Augustine Commission is debating it, in which humans, we hope, will get back to deep space destinations. And of course the moon is a destination of relevance to Mars and to, and to scientific exploration. Now this is not a conference about the moon, but I show this intro video for a minute to remind you that to get to Mars, is a trip that is so many times farther than anything in human exploration history, we got to remember that we need every trick in the book. We need our great robotic spacecraft. There's a view from, of course, the Spirit uh, rover on Mars, Steve Squire's uh, fantastic mission that's still running years after the event. So what's it going to take? Well, let me go back in time for a minute um, as I try to paint the picture of the Mars frontier and just give a few highlights that you can think about over the next couple days. The first highlight, I think, for many of us is really what does Mars look like? Well, I had a vision when I first came to NASA a long time ago, which was to look at Mars the way these images show. This is Mars in 3D. What I'm showing you is, in fact, not a photographic record, but a record of 700 million laser measurements of the 3D structure of Mars. Now, why am I doing that? This seems pretty mundane and boring. But in fact, this data set, together with gravity information, shown here in color, hot colors high, low colors, uh, cold colors low, reflects the physiography of the planet we have, geography of the planet we have, this data to land on Mars. People, machines, ants, whatever you want. Um, 
And what's so spectacular about it, really, is the tremendous magnitude of the topography of the planet. How did a planet smaller than Earth put together such a tremendous range of relief? So I'd like to stop for a minute. This is the North Polar Cap of Mars. It's been called the Great Hockey Puck. Um, it contains a volume of water ice discovered from this mission, the Mars Global Surveyor, now a decade ago, uh, that is equivalent to the Greenland ice sheet on Earth. Now, if you think that's irrelevant, just remember that global climate variability on our planet can be measured through the ice sheet records of our planet. This is a critical goal in the National Academy Decadal Survey for Earth Science. Here on Mars, we have a Mars equivalent. So one of the themes that we've all come up with over the last 20 years of Mars exploration is using Mars as Mother Nature's great control experiment for understanding our own world and aspects of its destiny. And I'll show you at the end of my little talk um, how we use Mars on Earth to color and train our thinking. Steve Squires had a team of scientists, many of whom were experts in Earth science. Now, I also like to stop at this picture because we've all seen the photographs of Olympus Mons. Many, many of you in the room know the Jeopardy question. The tallest mountain in the solar system that we know about, what is Olympus Mons, blah, blah, blah. Great stuff, okay? Anyone watch Jeopardy? I know it's early. Good, okay, just checking. Uh, but this is really more important than just a big mountain because that flank of stuff, and I can't point to it because I think I'm pointing disabled, but I'll try to. This large escarpment here, okay, which is deeper and taller than most mountains on Earth, um, as several kilometers, is actually told us a story from Mars that we mapped to Earth. And what is that story? That large, big, heavy mountains made of lava collapse upon their own weight in a gravity field and produce effects. On Earth, we discovered these around most of the big oceanic island arc volcanoes, including those like Hawaii, La Reunion, et cetera. If this were to happen around big oceanic volcanoes in the Atlantic, we would have tsunamis here in Maryland. So the idea that flank collapse of giant volcanoes is controlled by their mass and gravity is not something new, but we first recognized it as important on Earth by looking at Mars. Interesting how our planetary and our, our universe perspectives can color us. So Mars has told us about Earth. I'm proud of this data, partly because it reflects something that we needed to know. This data set I'm flying you over, Valles Marineris, was considered in 2001 by mem members of the National Academy as one of the few definitive planetary data sets we have as we look at our solar system. So it's very spectacular. Now, what we've learned to do as we look at Mars and as we've built a program architecture is to, um, sorry about that, is to uh, convert the perspective from that view in 3D to the view in 3D colored by the chemistry and topology of the surface. So here, we've combined the data from the Global Surveyor with Mars Odyssey to produce a spectacular fly-through, a scientific visualization of Valles Marineris. Now, of course, here's Los Angeles for scale. It probably should be Washington, but, you know, forgive us. Our, our poetic license. It just shows the sheer magnitude of some of the processes on Mars. How does the planet rip itself apart and produce escarpments and valleys that are five to ten times those on Earth? A lot of people have said, well, you know, it doesn't have plate tectonics, whatever. But this is what makes Mars so spectacular. It, as Ed Weiler has said many times, hopefully to many of you, uh, it doesn't read our textbooks. So the fact that it doesn't and that there is a stratigraphy in the walls of these canyons uh, is a reflection of the history of another world. By the way, our Grand Canyon would fit right here. I just came back from the rim. It's a great place to go. Recommend it. Um, so magnitude, topology, history. How do we see Mars? Well, the other thing that Mars has taught us is to be ready for the unanticipated. And this is what's so beautiful about science in the whole universe. You'll hear about that from, from uh, Mario and John next. But as we started to get to know Mars through the, the mundane landscapes and the exciting ones, what did we see? We saw features that were not familiar to us. A lot of people said, well, all the landscapes on Mars, we've seen those on Earth. And the answer I must tell you is not at all. And so as we got to know the surface, starting in, in 2004 with the landings of the rovers as part of our program, we started to see Mars at our own human scale. And this was an important step, because while Viking took us to this scale, it didn't allow us to move within uh, within the, the features that we wanted to understand. So what were the great contributions of the Mars Exploration Rover still running now after 1,600 some days on Mars? Well, I'd like to start with where we were in May 2000. In May 2000, uh, Ed Weiler and the leaders of NASA were, were posed a question. What do we do now that we've just lost two Mars missions? 